69% of the problems that couples have are what are called perpetual problems, which are reoccurring problems that may not have a solution that you will be arguing about forever. And if you stop arguing about it, that means that it's bad. It's probably bad, it's actually. You probably don't care right. enough to have this argument anymore and you've just given up. Okay, Maria, so you are a relational wellness therapist. Correct. What does that mean, relational therapy? You're putting me on the spot right now. I'm away. sorry, because <laughs> when I looked it up, I was like, oh, I, I haven't heard of that before. Yeah, so essentially it, the root of all of our lives are relationships, right? We exist mm -hmm. within relationships, whether that be to ourselves, whether that be to our families, our work, even things. So we have a relationship with this space. So if we look at everything as existing within this concept of relationships, then we can either have wellness or unwellness with essentially everything. So I work mm. with that relational space and relational wellness to make sure or to help individuals find that wellness within their relationships, whatever that looks like. Okay, cool. That actually reminds me, I was, I think I was looking at the study a couple of days ago. It's from 2020, but they did this huge study with couples and they measured like, what does it mean to be in a happy relationship. And the kind of main point they got out of it is that everything is, to your point, is kind of like your perception and your experience of that relationship. So that's a huge thing if you think about it. Like the other person, obviously you choose wisely, but it's very much about your own experience and your own kind of preconceived notion, the trauma from past, like just the way you look at it. I feel like for us and in, in with couples and relationship, we always put a lot of emphasis and weight on what the other person is doing or believing or, you know what I mean? Yeah. And I think that that's where a lot of the problems arise, essentially, when you're thinking about what is the other person doing? How are they doing things wrong? Where are they missing the mark? As opposed to kind of turning it around on ourselves and saying, what am I doing? Or how am I showing up? Or what is my perception of things at this moment? And how can I check myself or, you know, check in with myself and mm -hmm. kind of check this perception that I'm having of everything that's happening? Even if you think about they're doing something wrong, it's again, just your perception of their doing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Yes, it is. So the other person has really nothing to do with this. <laughs> oh, I mean, I think they are because they're interacting, right? Of course, they're here. Yeah. Something There's is feedback. happening. There's yes. feedback. Yeah. And yet we have this lens through which we view their behavior. Mm -hmm. And depending on how we grew up, depending on whether we got enough sleep, depending if we are hungry, <laughs> depending on the hungry part, the is, hungry real. part is, is real, right? That really provides a lens through mm -hmm. which we see their behavior. And sometimes it will be the exact same behavior. And if we woke up in a certain great mood, we're fine. And we're able to kind of say, okay, yeah, that's just this person, they're doing their thing. Mm -hmm. But if we got into an argument the night before, then it's really amped up and it looks very different. Again, same behavior, different context. So which brings me to communication in relationship, because it's a big term. Everyone uses it. I mean, even for myself, whenever I get asked or Gary and I get asked about, oh, what's, you know, what makes your relationship work? We're like, we over communicate, it's communication. <laughs> but what does that really mean? Because I truly believe that a lot of people communicate, like you have to communicate, but what is an effective communication in a relationship and what's a non-effective? communication or relationship. Sometimes you do communicate and the other person does not understand right. how you are communicating. So effective communication is sharing information in a way that the other person is able to understand what you are trying to say mm -hmm. and perceive what you're trying to say, I think, with some sort of kindness or respect for what you are saying and is able to respond in a way that mirrors that essence, essentially, and in return is able to provide a response that allows for understanding. So we okay, get it, we understand it. 
So imagine that you and I are married Mm -hmm. (laughs) and we have just started doing the dishes Mm -hmm. and I'm having a whole thought about how the dishwasher was loaded, right? Right. Effective communication would allow me to share what I'm feeling about the dishwasher, how it is having an impact on me without attacking you in the way that you loaded the dishwasher and present it to you in a way that allows you to then understand what I'm saying without feeling attacked, right? And then you're kind of like, oh, I see what you're saying about the dishwasher. Let me, whatever it may be. Or Mm -hmm. that doesn't mean that you have to agree with what I've just said about the dishwasher, but it does say, I see what you're saying. I understand it. I don't agree with it. Here's how we can figure something out about the dishwasher. Again, very basic example that I think a lot of people struggle with. (laughs) A hundred percent. So an ineffective uh is, I just look at you and I'm like, you're doing it wrong. 100%. Yeah. The end. I'm not ready to. So you communicated, but it really didn't do anything. At all. And do you see that happen often in your practice of this ineffective? But do people come with thinking that they're communicating and they're getting frustrated that the message is not heard? For the most part, when couples come in, they're so frustrated because it's almost so evident that the way that they are sharing information is just not being understood because it leads to an escalation, because it leads into, I have no idea how to get to you and for you to understand what I'm trying to say. So I think that by the time couples are ready to come in, they're like, yeah, this isn't working. And whatever I'm speaking, whatever language I'm sharing here, it's just not being understood. And I see it often when I'm kind of looking at the interactions between couples and as an outsider, I'm seeing it and I'm like, oh, I know what's happening. I see it. I know what's happening. You're like, I just want to tweak this one thing and that's it. You guys are happy again. I mean, I wish it could be that easy, but it's very interesting to be this third person that is observing and seeing, Mm. oh, I see why you took that that way. Or I see why your perception was this way, but that's not how that person probably intended it, right? Right. They they had something to share and you took that as, oh, they're criticizing me. Or you took that as a threat Mm. because we have had history or we, again, you know, things have happened in the relationship. So you've come to some extent predisposed to the conversation that this person is out to get me or they're here to criticize me or whatever that may be. But as an outsider, I'm like, oh, I know what's happening. I see it. <laughs> I I feel like, I mean, back in the day, being married was more simple, at least looked simpler because you kind of didn't have choices in a way. You made a commitment and that commitment mattered. Mm. But these days, you know, we have so many more options and I feel like we get so distracted and you just have to be so much more aware of like yourself and when you come from and what relationship you're going to in order for that relationship to succeed. So when I heard, um, I actually posted about it. I, um, I was talking to this young couple and they mentioned how they went to therapy together and they just like, they've been dating for a few months, right? Nothing crazy. And to me, it was just like, whoa, 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 like red flag. What are you talking about? Uh And they laid it out for me in a way that you just said, right? Like we want to make sure that our experiences from the past and, you know, certain childhood things don't come and break this opportunity to have like a successful relationship or we want to make sure that the way we communicate with each other is actually effective and I was like sitting there being like oh my god these 20 something year olds you know like it's amazing I know and but you have to now do I think so much more work before you going in a into a relationship like do you find that yeah so I Don't remember exactly what I was reading, but they have, it was something in all the gazillion podcasts that Mm -hmm. I get into about relationships. And they were talking about how a lot of relationships now, there's a lot of negotiating roles, Mm -hmm. right? So who is the person that 
um, takes care of the house and who's the person that takes care of the kids and who goes, quote unquote, out to earn and financially uh, provide for the family. And if we look, you know, decades back, it was pretty well laid out. You knew where you stood. You knew your roles, essentially, because a lot of it was just a given. And to some extent now there's a lot of, well, there are no quote unquote rules. You yeah. get to define that for yourself. And so that creates a lot of ambiguity and that creates a lot of moments where things do have to be communicated, uh, where things have to be reassessed, where we have to have more talks. And before it was like, yep, that's this what you it. do. This right. is it. And yeah. there is no negotiation. This is just how it goes. And so there is more work in that sense. And I think as a whole, we're just understanding what you said, how much our earlier experiences have an impact on our relationships and how it is kind of like a make or break kind of thing. And there's so much information about it. Everybody is looking to have these great relationships. I was just, you know, I was just thinking that I wonder how many relationships I would have skipped if I have done the work, <laughs> I hear the you. work prior to, you know. I hear you. Yes. Yeah. Um, something that I find that comes up a lot uh, in my interaction with my community, specifically to relationship, is actually these really important conversations like finances, mm -hmm. right? So what are some strategies that you would recommend for a couple to sit down and talk about it without getting triggered or making it a personal thing? I think first thing is to expect that you might be triggered as opposed mm. to thinking that you won't. So finances is one of those things that naturally have some sort of emotion attached to it, right? If we think back to a childhood, was money abundant? Was money scarce? And so we all have a money story that we bring to the table when we come into relationships. And so prepare for discomfort, but have the conversation. So I think the biggest thing is actually to be open to having the conversation. A lot of couples don't have the talk, the financial talk. And then of course it's like, oh, we're in a relationship and now we're having all of these arguments or now we've moved in together and we didn't discuss that. That's we were like the scariest be thing for, for me. Cause I grew yeah. up in a very, I feel like negative money mm -hmm. household mm -hmm. where everything was about it. Yes. And I remember growing up, I was just like, I'll never in my relationship, in my marriage, I never want to talk about money. Oh, I know. But that was also another toxic thing because it's just not realistic right? Yes. in today's landscape. So it took me so long and I'm still relearning certain things of how to have these conversations with my husband because in the beginning we got married and I'm just like you you, you, you take do the care thing. of that yeah. you, can, you can figure it out <laughs> yeah. but uh, as I get older I understand the importance of also you know understanding what's going on in our household and um, it's a lot of work to like rewire mm -hmm. all that I feel like more and more as we continue talking I'm like wow this pre like, obviously, once you find a person, you're like, okay, this might be the person for me going to do this therapy and going through the list of like finances, this, this, like, what is your take? What is your trauma? What is, that's amazing. Would have been um, a lot of work to do with the relationships I've had. Uh, let's talk about intimacy. Yes. Intimacy is something that specifically in long-term relationship like I've been married for 11 years it's kind of like goes up and down and up and down and life gets so in the way with you know that connection with each other mm -hmm. how do you do you have any advice on rekindling intimacy yeah so when we think about intimacy I think a lot of us think oh yeah physical intimacy and where is that component but intimacy is actually composed of so many things that you can have emotional intimacy, you can have spiritual intimacy, you can have experiential intimacy, and then of course the physical that we're mostly accustomed to speaking about. And so when we look at intimacy as just connection to this person, then that kind of really broadens the scope of the 
things and ways in which we can connect. Because if we're just focusing on that physical component, then we're really lacking intimacy as a whole. Because for most of us, it's, you know, I don't want to have any physical intimacy if I don't feel emotionally connected to you. If I right. feel that we've been at work all day and we haven't touched base throughout the day and now you want to come home and do what? No. <laughs> <laughs> right. That's just not going to happen. So when we open up the scope of what intimacy looks like, then that means, all right, so how do we find ourselves back to each other in the busyness? How do we find ways in which we understand? How do we find ways in which it allows us to rekindle, as mm -hmm. you say? And I think that one of the things about this idea of rekindling is that we are, to some extent, chasing those butterflies or those initial feelings that we may have had at the beginning of the relationship, right? And that's just not realistic. Right. You're not going to have those feelings because this person is known. Those feelings are the unknown, the excitement, the what could be a little bit of the anxiety if they're not returning your phone calls or texts or, you know, they've left you on red. So that is <laughs> yeah. part of that excitement and that unknown. And so for a lot of couples, you know, they think about, oh, we've just lost the spark and we're just not feeling the same things that we used to. You're feeling different things because you're just in a different stage of the relationship, Things are no longer unknown. You're probably in a routine. You probably know where you're going to wake up, how you're going to brush your teeth, what breakfast you're going to have. And so that feels like, oh, we've just settled into this sparkless relationship. And that may be true. You may be feeling this way. And there's so many ways in which we miss connections with our partners, which feel like this rekindling, right? Mm -hmm. And I think about the idea that anybody, quote unquote, can fall in love, but I don't think that everybody can stay in 100%. love. And okay. I mean, stay in love in the sense of, are you speaking to your partner with mm -hmm. love? Are you thinking about your partner with love in the ways that you think about them? And are you doing things together that are loving? So expanding that idea of intimacy as connection and finding ways to constantly reconnect with each other. And speaking about reconnection, I mean, often we kind of call date nights, oh, this is our quality time. Yes. And we go out to dinner yeah. and we sit down and we catch up on a few things, but then we're like, hmm. And you look around and you see other couples that are sitting around the restaurant. With their phones. And some of them on their phones. <laughs> yes. Other ones are like doing something else. Mm -hmm. And I'm just, I actually had that. I talked to Gary about it. I'm like, this is not quality time. We're yeah. not connecting. Mm -hmm. And it made me realize how I have to sit down and try to understand, I mean, together with him as well, what is quality time for us? Beautiful. Yeah. What kind of instances or experiences can we have that will feel like we're connecting? Dinner is not one of, one of them. Maybe for some people it is. So even that, like we do it and so automatically because you just see it, oh, it's date night, yes. you know, yeah. and you go out for dinner. What are some other, like, what are some examples in general of ways Beautiful. So I think that actually, it's not that I'm not a fan of date night. I think that it's just very precise in terms of, oh, this is the moment that we have set up <laughs> to right. have dinner and to be a couple. Yeah. Right? And so it really... It feels a bit outdated, no? Like we need to... It feels outdated new... and it feels like also a lot of pressure if you think about it in terms of, oh, we're going out to date night and this is the moment when it happens. <laughs> and the reality is that we're missing so many moments of connection throughout the week. Mm -hmm. Smaller moments where you make a coffee for your partner and you, you know, leave a note of like, hey, hope you have a great day, right? It sounds so basic in comparison to this big date night, right? right? And yet we know that the more that we're able to notice these small things that we're able to notice our partner turning towards us or giving us attention, like something as small as putting the phone down when your partner is talking to you or sharing something that you're excited about, that is connection. And that can be 
just as, if not more, more powerful, powerful. Yeah. than a date night because you have this moment of I'm listening. You have my undivided attention, whatever that may be. I remember, I, I don't even know where I read it, but there was the concept of like sliding doors mm -hmm. where there are moments throughout the day or the week with your partner or in any relationship really where you have an opportunity to either open the door or shut the door. Oh, I love that. In these small little moments. Yes. So to your point, you know, mm -hmm. when... My, and I, honestly, I'm still struggling with it because my attention is like everywhere. But the paying attention, the doing something for this person, for uh, just small, tiny things that actually don't require that much effort. It's more about the intention. To me, that's one of my, I'm always like sliding doors, sliding doors. Was that a sliding door moment? Yeah. <laughs> He talks to me and I'm, I'm, pay, I'm not paying attention. I'm like, wait, sliding door. Okay, I'm here. Yes, I love that. That's a great visual. And it, it is very much that same idea of turning towards or turning away. Mm -hmm. So you've shared something with me. Am I open, that open door and turning towards you? Or am I closed and I'm, you know, headed in the other direction and not paying attention yeah. to you? So I love that visual. I'm going to take it with me. <laughs> take it away. I hope it helps. Is there any other technique, especially visual ones? Because to me, it's something that helps me to remember things that you do in your in your practice with, uh, with clients? Setting intentional time for the connections, but with a purpose, right? So we might have specific questions to ask one another or specific check-ins as opposed to just leaving it open. You know, if you think about sitting down and you're like, how's your day? Great, great. G good, right? Those are like the options. When you ask questions or you have a moment to connect over a specific thing, like what was the most challenging part of your day today? Or what do you feel most grateful? Or how do you feel most motivated? And how can I help with that, right? So the more that we are curious about our partner's world and what's going on with them, the more connection that we can have. I don't know if that's visual, but it yeah, is a tool just, that yeah. we utilize in terms of asking specific questions and being more curious about that person's world, especially because we're often living in two different worlds, right? Whether that is I've got my work or I've got the kids and we're not really making it into each other's world mm -hmm. until we share that, until we ask, until we look a little bit deeper into that person's life. Which I had, I, I really wanted to cover actually the point of evolving and growing in a relationship mm -hmm. And keeping that connection still going, because that's so hard. I feel like even for myself, I mean, my husband and I, we have a pretty large age gap and we often talk about it. Yeah. When we got married, he was 38. He's kind of like a grown man. He knows who he is. He knows what he wants. I was 20. Mm -hmm. I don't know who I am. I don't know where I'm going, what I'm doing. I know. So I often ask him, like, how did you, that's a big challenge to take on because I probably changed already five times since we got married, Yeah. right? So seeing your partner evolving and growing in a relationship and maybe even growing in a way that you don't really know how to handle or didn't really go by the way you thought it's going to go, how do you deal with that? We always go back and forth. I mean, there's no really concrete kind of answer, but obviously patience is a big thing. Mm -hmm. But what do you recommend uh to do for couples that do feel that disconnect because they are no longer the person they were when they got together. Yeah. And I hope that they're not, right? A hundred percent. I hope that they're not the same person that yeah. they were when they first got together because then that means we're stagnant and we're mm. not growing. So it's very interesting how we frame or how we choose to frame this person's change and growth. Mm -hmm. So are we viewing that person's development as exciting and wow look at all the great and amazing things that they are doing and how do I get to be a part of that or how do I get to learn from this person that is evolving and that's one way to look at it the other way is this is a threat and this person growing and changing I don't like it like this is just not something that I'm up for and yep now we're disconnected Right. Right. And that can very much happen, especially as you're talking about this age gap. Mm -hmm. So looking at your husband, does he encourage you 
in terms of your growth? Does he say like, that looks great. Tell me more about it. Or I don't want to know. I'm not interested. This is a threat to who we were and how we started out as a couple. And now you're changing and I don't like it. So there's either a flexible mindset to it and relationships are dynamic and they're changing and I hope that you change and I'm excited Mm -hmm. or relationships are rigid and this is not what I signed up for. So you better get back in line to, (laughs) you know, the day that we made our vows. So stay curious again, stay excited for that person's growth Mm -hmm. and view yourself as part of that story. Gary, in that regard, I feel like I really want the jackpot because Mm -hmm. he's like, he's so supportive that I'm just like, stop being so supportive. (laughs) Let me, let me try to catch up with all this growth. But, um, you know, in certain relationships, when someone grows, they want the other person partner the other person to grow as well and they not might not want to grow what do you do in that instance where how do you like propel this Mm. like come join me yeah that's a really hard one because that happens a lot and it happens a lot to individuals who are looking to do the work and so that looks like well I'm ready to focus on my physical health because I've neglected that so I'm ready to join the gym I'm ready to go to therapy I'm ready to do all the things that you know have gotten me to this point I'm ready to make some changes and if the partner or the person that you're with is not ready there's an invitation that can be made. I'd love for you to join me here. Let me invite you in. Let me show you all the things that I am doing. But ultimately, if that person does not want to join us, Mm -hmm. as heartbreaking and as painful as that may be, there is very little that we can do about it. Yeah, There's very little that we can do because that person needs to want it as well. Mm -hmm. We can't push. We can't bring them along with us and pull them along. Kind of like, you know, when you're walking your dog and the dog doesn't want to walk and you're just like dragging them along. You can do it for a little bit. and For a little bit. And then you know. Yeah. Yes. And there's only so much we can do. And that, that happens. Mm -hmm. And that is also something that I deal with, with the couples that I work with. We, one person is ready to change. The other one isn't. And now we are at this crossroad and that's tough and that's hard and it isn't always the question I mean it isn't always the answer that we want to give as therapists because I think as therapists we want to make sure that everybody's in happy and healthy relationships but sometimes that happiness and sometimes that healthiness actually comes outside of the relationship outside of the relationship so there are instances that you sit down and you're like you guys (laughs) this is not working out (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> Not in those specific words, but yes, essentially yeah. going in a, I need you guys to think about whether this is something that you want to continue to mm. do. If this person continues to show up this way, is this the life that you want? Imagine your life a year from now and nothing has changed and it looks exactly like this. Mm-hmm. How are you feeling about that? And they're like, oh no, this is, I right. can't do this. We can't be here another year. So when you ask those kinds of questions, it's almost kind of like saying, you guys, you know. It's time. It's time. (laughs) Let's talk about commitment. Mm. Um, I feel like a lot of us have an idea of what it is in a relationship. Um, And then when we get into a relationship, the commitment doesn't look that way. And we're like, okay, this is, you know, we're kind of breaking down a relationship that might be good. So is there kind of an overall definition to commitment? Like what do you suggest people to think about when they think about, am I ready to commit to this person? Well, that goes down to what is your definition Mm -hmm. of commitment and being clear with that and seeing if you are in alignment with that definition of commitment. So my commitment may look very different than yours. And what do we say is okay when it comes to a committed relationship? What do we say is not okay? So this is one of those areas that again is very personal, very open to negotiation, right? which goes back to this idea of before there were no negotiations, this is it. This is commitment. This is what it looks like. It's all a negotiation. So let me know. What do you think about, oh, yeah, no, that doesn't work for me. So let's, yeah. you know, see where 
we can kind of meet halfway or I'm not willing to budge on this, then this is what I'm willing to give. So it's very much an ongoing conversation as well. I have a friend, she's also been married for a long time, and we were talking about, you know, being married for a long time and the changes that occur and how the relationship changes and kind of dealing with it. And she said, I decided with myself that I'm going to renegotiate the contract Mm -hmm. with myself first of like what I'm willing, what are my new boundaries, what are my old boundaries that I'm like letting go um, and then presenting it to my husband. And then it's like we're resigning this, you know, yeah lease or contract or whatever it is. <laughs> it's a love lease, yes. <laughs> a love lease. And I love that because mm-hmm. I think that we're slowly, especially in today's landscape and the redefinition that happens along all these like terms, like what marriage looks like, what this contract mm-hmm. looks like, all these things. It's like we have to be able to redefine things not very often but like every like a few increments of time you know maybe every five maybe every 10 years Mm -hmm. to try to kind of put new terms in there Um, because it's not it never stays that way and I think a lot of the times marriages fall through just because they just didn't get to that okay let's renegotiate what was you know done before yeah what are some myths in like around relationship and therapy that you feel like people have all wrong. Going back to this idea of relationships are dynamic, they're constantly changing. So why wouldn't we renegotiate? We're not the same people in our 20s that will be in our 30s, our 40s, our 50s. So it is very important to have these ongoing conversations. Life changes, we change. Mm -hmm. So much happens. So to expect to not have to renegotiate, that's probably unrealistic. And you said something really interesting, which was, okay, perhaps we don't need to have it all the time, right? which is true because then that creates a lot of chaos for the relationships. Mm-hmm. Like we're constantly going back and forth with the renegotiations and this was okay yesterday, but it's not okay today. Right. Then it doesn't give us a sense of stability or safety within the relationship because at any point, the agreements that we've come to can just be thrown to the side. And now I don't feel safe. You see, I feel like I need more narratives like that or more stories like that, more movies about mm. that rather than like, okay, I'm looking for my, you know, love of my life. You meet them, marriage, movie ends, wedding, movie ends. I know. What happens after? Thank you. There's so many things. <laughs> yes. I think there needs to be so many a movie of, because I think there was a movie of uh, uh, that was following this kid from like the age 10 to 25 or something like yes. that. Yes. They need to do that with marriage. They do. They really do because all we see is the romantic comedies and I am a for sure hopeless romantic. Yeah. I am a product of romantic comedies from the 90s. All the Hugh Grants and the best. The best. And so interesting that you say that because I was thinking about that regarding this is what I see. And then I look at my relationships Mm -hmm. and that's not what they look like. Mm -hmm. So I look at my parents or I look at my grandparents and there's a lot of disconnect between what I'm seeing on the screen and what I'm actually experiencing. Mm -hmm. And so am I understanding that this is reality or am I understanding that the romantic comedy is the reality? And so I'm striving for this idea Right. That's of, unclear. Really. That is unclear. <laughs> right. It's unclear and it's beautiful, but it's not realistic because again, yeah. we only see that falling in love. We don't see the staying in mm-hmm. love movie at all. Okay. If you could direct a staying in love movie, yeah, <laughs> what would it be like? Let's call it a mini series. Oh, I like there it. There are like eight episodes. Okay. Okay. <laughs> what are What is each episode focusing on? Okay. So one, it's not always that exciting, right? So a lot of relationships are very much just going through the day to day and it's very ordinary. Mm -hmm. It isn't over the top. Most of the times there isn't really all that much happening. And I think that we forget to take that into consideration because that would not make for a very exciting show. Yeah. So imagine a whole episode of this series. <laughs> of just loading the dishwasher. Of just loading the dishwasher. Of just walking the dog. Of doing these very small tasks yeah. that make up and comprise 
your life, you would be like, yeah, that's not going to make it. I don't want to watch that show. Yeah. But that is the reality. And that is what life entails. And if we look at reality TV, it really does have to be amped up. So there does have to be some drama. There does have to be some exciting thing that is happening in order for us to, to view that. I mean, life in and of itself will throw some curveballs your way, yeah. but they don't happen in one episode or one specific. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it happens through it a lifetime. It feels like we're engineering ourselves for unhappiness. I mean, mm. society and pop culture is engineering mm. us to be unhappy because it's true. Like reality TV, like everything is these huge, you know, ups and downs. Yes. There's no in-betweens. No. And the thing is that we know that healthy relationships are these neutral kind of places Mm -hmm. if we're if you're constantly going through the highs and the lows and the highs and the lows you have a toxic relationship yes right like you are not this is not going to last because it's not sustainable and yet that's kind of what we view as passion and that's what we view as excitement and again nobody talks about the dishwasher yeah. I feel like we, we keep going back to this dishwasher. We talk about this dishwasher. <laughs> we do. Um, we call it, uh, in my household, we call it Wednesdays. Okay. These days of just in between. Yes. And I think that's one of the perks of marrying an older mm-hmm. man for me was mm-hmm. that before we got married, he sat me down and he's like, listen, right now, you know, we're engaged. It's exciting. Everything new, everything's fresh, but there are going to be a lot of Wednesdays. And I was like, what is, yes, obviously every week there's a Wednesday. (laughs) He's like, no, there's going to be a lot of these really mundane things and it's not going to be exciting and it's not going to be fun, but I need you to realize it, accept it and like commit to it, you know, because that's the biggest bulk of our, of marriage, of partnership. And that was like, oh, okay. Did your husband go to therapy? Because this is very... You know what? No, but he's... And he wasn't married before either. So I'm just like, where is all this... There's so much wisdom. Wisdom coming from. Wisdom in Wednesdays. Again, I'm taking that to therapy Wednesday, as sliding well. doors. Sliding doors, Wednesday. I'm making a list. Like I, did, <laughs> you know, I just came here for you to give me all these tips to take into the uh, therapy room. I just... Uh, I'm just packaging them up for you. Thank you. Thank um, you. Okay. So dishwasher, mundane days, yeah, mundane not exciting. Days. Episode one. Yes. Episode two, discomfort mm. and discomfort as okay. It's not that the relationship is going to end or that the relationship is on the rocks. You're going to be uncomfortable right? You're going to be irritated. You're going to be frustrated. You will just have to sit with that and self-soothe and work through it and have a moment and communicate about it. And it doesn't mean that the relationship is over. So essentially just tolerating the discomfort of having to share a life with somebody that does something completely different Mm. than you. And you want them to do things the same way that you would because that's the right way to do it, right? right? (laughs) But they don't. And so you're just going to have to tolerate the discomfort of that. Mm -hmm. Again, not an exciting episode. (laughs) And the discomfort changes through time, right? Mm. Like you get used to it. You find a middle ground. They can do a little bit, some of the things, the way you do them. Mm-hmm. It's very uncomfortable in the beginning, but it gets easier. But then there's new stuff that makes Then there's new stuff. Oh, my God. Oh, yeah. So 100% the probably the first year, if you haven't lived together with your partner, it's there's a lot. There's a lot of where did you put the toothbrush and why is it there and why is the toothpaste, you know, squeezed from the middle and not the end whatever, you will find it because you will notice this person doing things differently than yeah. you. And then you get past that and you're just like, that's just how they are. Mm-hmm. This is a toothpaste situation. Mm-hmm. And then it turns into, and I know that you're a mother, so it turns into how do we handle the kids and how do we discipline and you do it differently than I do and this is how I grew up and this is how you grew up. And now I'm really uncomfortable. Mm. about, again, another thing because we're two different people. I love that episode. I would watch it. Yeah. (laughs) Episode number three. (laughs) Episode number three. Maybe two episodes is good. (laughs) (laughs) Maybe. Yeah. Maybe that would be enough to just give a little A little reality of it. After watching 
Yes. A romantic comedy from the I 90s. Know. But then do you think that anybody would want to be in a relationship if they knew? And they'd just be like, you know what? I'm going to stay by myself. <laughs> I mean, you see it more and more now where a lot of um, women, I feel like women have kind of more choice mm. and they choose to be like, I don't need this. Mm -hmm. I don't need children. I don't need family. And mm -hmm. I think it's, um, I admire that because I think it takes a lot of self-awareness to understand where you want to pour yourself into because a relationship is a lot like you said you know being in it's a different person and you're trying to combine a life you know two lives together yeah and that's just that's so much work and that's not even bringing in all these other factors and you touched on you know having children mm -hmm. and I mean I think a lot of people that started a family they can attest to the strain that bringing children into a relationship you know that the kind of strain it puts on a relationship mm -hmm. parenting styles and you know our own childhood trauma bringing coming up loud and clear how do you help couples navigate that <sighs> there's a lot of patience <laughs> and tolerance for that and shifting away from the idea of this is right and this is wrong into we'll have to figure out what works mm -hmm. as opposed to getting stuck on this idea of this is how it's supposed to be or this is how it should be. So, and that goes with the negotiation component again, right? I come to this place with these ideas. You come with yours. I clearly believe that I am right. Mm -hmm. And in order for this to work, we'll have to understand that it's not about what's right or what's wrong, but what works. Yeah. And then you have to adjust it to the child you're dealing with because mm -hmm. here's another person mm -hmm. in the formula, right? Yeah. In the equation. Yeah. Then it gets more complicated, <laughs> right? The more moving pieces that you yeah. include in the equation, the more things you'll have to deal with. It's, it's layered, yeah. right? And then the system becomes more complicated. And then there's the in-laws and then there's uh, the development of the relationship and then we're getting older. So now we're aging and now we have to deal with new things. And it's this constant negotiation. Negotiation, yeah. signing <laughs> contract after contract. Oh, there's love in there sometimes, you know, like... Where does love mm. land, maybe percentage-wise, just so I can really see it visually, into the formula of like a successful marriage? I love the idea of love as a feeling. Mm -hmm. And there's also this idea of love as a verb. So it can go in terms of how do I feel about you? I love you. And then there's also love as a verb, which is how do I show love? Mm -hmm. So how do I, again, think in loving ways, act in loving ways, behave in loving ways? So that love is always at the center of mm -hmm. the relationship or the ways in which we interact with one another. And then, you know, the feeling component. Is it all warm and gushy and do you feel great about this person? Probably not all the time. Right. <laughs> so understanding that you won't always have these positive, amazing feelings for the person that you're sleeping next to and that that's okay because you will be frustrated. You will be annoyed. You will, you know, want to push them off the bed. Mm -hmm. And that's all part of the relationship. It's not just the love and loving parts. It is all of it. At least for me, you nailed down the concept of like successful relationship with these two aspects of like patience and negotiation. Because I really think that that's, that's what I'm always trying to extract. You know what I mean? Like give me the two things. Even when I asked you, what is commitment to you? So I understand, uh, what is commitment in general? I understand that it's personal, but yeah. I don't know if it's personal. I think there is a universal aspect of what it means and how it shows up in a relationship. And I think the commitment to be patient and tolerate at times, you have to just tolerate. And also the kind of re-signing that contract, right? Like you committed to sticking around. Yeah. I think people get confused with what commitment is sometimes, you know? Yeah. And I think to some extent, to some people that commitment is... Is there a ring on your finger? Did you sign a paper? Mm -hmm. 
And that is, by my definition, you know, very outdated way of thinking about commitment because so many people can get engaged. So many people can get married and it means nothing. Nothing. So what value do you give to commitment? What attributes do you provide for that? Mm -hmm. And one of the things that you were saying about commitment and committed to patience and committed to respect Mm -hmm. and committed to these bigger ideals than just the marriage or this person, Mm -hmm. right? So if you are a person that is committed to showing up, then you will show up as your best self in the relationship. If you're a person that is committed to honesty, then you will be honest in all areas and you'll be honest in your relationship. So I wonder if this idea of commitment is almost kind of like looking at ourselves and saying, what am I committed to? What are the things that are important to me that I will bring. And then this Mm -hmm. person also kind of checks in with themselves and says, well, I'm committed to this. So we come to the table with these commitments and how we show up and I take care of myself, you take care of yourself. And it turns out that in doing that, we're taking care of each other and being committed to one another. See, that to me is so much more powerful to have that responsibility for yourself. And again, like do the work to me now when I think about a successful marriage or relationship is very much of do so much work on yourself where you're so clear on your commitments and so clear on your needs and wants and the way you communicate and want to be communicated to. And then you find the person, right, that hopefully did same amount of work or <laughs> less you can inspire them. Yeah. But it feels that that's kind of where it's at these days. Uh, because again, based on, you know, the way marriage started, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, but it started very much of more of a survival construct, right? There like is you a financial component Financial component, it. yeah, a status component. Mm-hmm. And I don't know how much of it, like it evolved, but no one really made a kind of statement on it. Like even still, I, I read certain um, articles or certain, like, you know, in shows and movies and stuff like that, it still kind of feels so outdated and not in line with what it is we're craving now and is what happening in reality in marriages and relationships. Yeah, I was just thinking about that, you know, the origins of marriage and a lot of it was to make sure, like if we think back to the medieval times where it was, we get married to make sure that we're able to keep our property, to make sure that the bloodlines remain a certain uh, way that we're able to continue to be in power. So a lot of it had to do with power, which is interesting because there's a lot of interesting power dynamics in marriage as well. But no, nobody's really talking. No, there are. Or maybe it's just because I'm in that world and I'm constantly thinking. Who's, Who's talking about it? Well, therapists, marriage therapists are definitely talking right, about it. But is it. there like a, a book or something that you oh. feel like is in line with today's? Yes. Um, so I think a book that really challenges everything regarding commitment, regarding relationships is this book called Mating in Captivity oh, yes. by Esther Perel. Oh, yeah. That blew she my really mind. She really revolutionized yes. the yeah. way we think about yeah. marriage and relationships 100%. in general. 100%. Yeah. Mm. So it was a big moment, like the emoji with like the brain mm. blowing up. That was kind of what reading that book was like because it just said, okay, we need to talk about things differently because we're not really helping anybody in these relationships by having these standards, by not talking about it, by just continuing to move along in the way that we are. So, and I think actually the term of negotiation was probably in something that I heard from Esther (laughs) in one of her podcasts, for sure. You touched on the power struggle in a relationship. What is it, (laughs) what does it look like? Mm -hmm. Just like, how do you identify Mm -hmm. a power struggle? All of our relationships are to some extent a power struggle Mm -hmm. and thinking about who's in charge or who gets to say what we do. Are we going to dinner at the place that you wanted to? Are we going to the movie that I chose? Are we choosing this or are we choosing that? So there's power dynamics for 
anything that we do, but Mm -hmm. especially in these intimate relationships because it's Mm one-on-one. Then there's that financial component, which says, is the person that is the breadwinner and brings in the money, is that the person who gets to decide what we do or how we run the household or is it the person that is in charge of the kids and you know because they're dealing with these things then they're in charge of whatever it might be so mm-hmm. there's so many dynamics regarding power that are present in all relationships but specifically romantic relationships how do you keep that intimacy and love and connection balanced with the power So I like to think about power as something that is flexible and dynamic and changing and shifting. And there are times when we want somebody to take the lead and sometime to take charge. And there are times when we want to take a step back. So viewing power not in this rigid kind of I'm in power and I'm in charge and I'm, you know, we're in a authoritarian Mm. dictatorship kind of power struggle Mm -hmm. but how do we share the power to be able to make this the best relationship how do we know when to take charge how do we know when to lean back and not hold on to this idea of what I say goes it makes me think of like the feminine masculine energies Mm -hmm. right like Mm -hmm. when to activate one side or the other in order for it to flow. Mm-hmm. So work-life balance. Mm. I really dislike the word, the word balance, not the word itself, but what it people define it as these days, which I feel like is getting better. It's more fluid. It's more moving. But work-life balance in a relationship is, I find, really complex. Mm-hmm. I have one situation where my husband and I work together, so that keeps us very connected and very in tune because we have like communicate, like we're in each other's world because of it, right? It's one world. Um, But so it's easier for him to support me and for me to support him. Mm -hmm. But um, in relationships where it's two different careers and it's two different worlds, how do you support your partner or like even try to be part of that world Mm -hmm. to continue growing together? When I think about couples whose work has become everything Mm -hmm. and that is the place where they go in terms of if I'm a lot of people use work for a stress reliever so like I will leave my emotional connection with my partner go to work to forget about the relationship or I'll throw myself into busyness or workaholism because that becomes kind of like the safety from the relationship. I know that's not what you were asking me, but that's kind of like what came up in terms of the thought process of like work and relationship balance. And you're right, there isn't always this balance. It's not going to be this 50-50 kind of thing because sometimes work will require us to give more and to do more because we're in a season of having to build or having to work on that business or having to give whatever that may be. And so to some extent, the relationship might be have less of a priority at that moment. So how do we navigate the fact that the relationship needs to, and this sounds terrible, but it's true. Like it's going to be less of a priority at yeah. this moment. Because, but I think that's a reality, right? No one talks about it. Yes. You know, I think that the other partner, if you have a partner that's fully focusing on his career and building something meaningful for future, mm-hmm. there is an animosity that's growing within the other partner because they are like, I'm neglected. I'm not a priority. Yes. How do you balance that? That is essentially this idea of that reconnecting and viewing the smaller things that are happening within the relationship as just as meaningful. So if we're looking at time, how do we view time in a way that says it's shorter and it feels more meaningful or more intentional? Mm -hmm. It is not exactly what I would have wanted, but I am here for this relationship for the long term. Mm -hmm. And I view this moment as a season. I'm here for, I mean, not forever, but, you know, 
usually when we get into relationships, we have this idea of forever. It might not be forever. That's okay, but we're here. Mm -hmm. We're here. We're showing up for, Mm -hmm. to some extent, a long-term relationship. And if we start to view that as, again, past, present, and future, then we see that potentially this is a period of time. So this is a period of time that this person might need to prioritize a business or some endeavor that they're working on. And it's not that I'm being left Mm -hmm. on the side. How can I be supportive of this time? How can I ask? Uh, How can I help? How can I be curious and be a part of it? And then, of course, the person who is, you know, making this other priority, they do have this responsibility to not take that person for granted as well and to come back and to check in. How are things going on your end? I know we've lost touch. I know that I've been so busy and I'm so thankful and grateful for the fact that you are here with me. So gratitude is actually a big one. And I think Mm. that we forget about it a lot because we do take this person for granted. Oh, you're here. Yeah. You're here forever. So again, you're just here. Mm -hmm. But how often do we say thank you for the small things that are happening? How often are we showing that gratitude with a text? How often are we looking at that person again shortly by making them a coffee or whatever it may be because we've been married for 11 years Mm -hmm. and I know you and you know me and you know we're here and we're good and yet we notice that when we start to lose these moments of gratitude that's when the relationship starts to erode and we see that the time that that person is spending at work as a threat Yeah. As opposed to, oh, we're building something together. And as this half of the partnership, I want to be responsible for these things while this person is working. So if we don't have the gratitude, if we don't have those check-ins, if we don't have these constant recommitments to each other, Mm -hmm. then that resentment starts to build in. And then we feel the neglect. And then we feel like, yeah, this is really not working for me at all it feels to me while while you were talking that intention is so big in everything and in general I feel I find that more and more intention is required so much in my daily lives Mm. and I feel like it threatens productivity for me okay (laughs) because we got so accustomed to doing so much Mm -hmm. all the time Mm. that we've lost that intentional like focus and intentional words and intentional yes. actions yeah and it's truly feels like to me I have to like okay we gotta throw the efficient not productivity efficiency out is it efficiency I think they both go hand in hand yes though. this idea of productivity constantly doing and efficiency yes. do it the quickest fastest way yes thank you so those two it's like I kind of have to realizing I'm sitting here talking to you I'm like I really have to now re put a different cadence to it in a way so I can live intentionally and have more intentional relationships. That's beautiful. And I think that culturally and socially speaking, we are driven to these efficient and productive ways of living. Are you doing enough? Do you need to do more? How do you do it quicker, faster? How do you do more? And that doesn't really work for our relationships because it's almost in the slow. It's in the intention. It's in the gradual, granule kind of things that you're able to see that love or that you're able to see those feelings that come about. If you're trying to be efficient and if you're trying to be productive with love, you'll feel it. And you're just like, you're just trying to like push me through and you're not really, you're not really present. Mm -hmm. You're not here. Thank you. Mm -hmm. It was a little, (laughs) a little aha moment. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Are there, I'm going to go back to the question because maybe I didn't um, ask it properly. Uh, In your practice, I'm just, that's my curious Mm -hmm. curiosity. Mm -hmm. Uh, In your practice, are there any kind of misconceptions that I that you see often of couples that come in, the misconceptions they hold about marriage or relationship, anything that's reoccurring that you're like, oh my God, like we have to stop believing this. I think I touched on a little bit um, in our previous 
kind of flow Mm -hmm. of thought, which was this idea of this is what a marriage should be look like mm-hmm. or this is what a relationship should well, that's true. Your, your tv series look like yes yes exactly okay so the tv series yeah which now i'm gonna have to think of more episodes <laughs> i will get back to you on the episode please do <laughs> i'm hoping at least eight just yes. like to make i mean it i think that there's a whole episode on in-laws and on other family members that come into the relationship and yeah have an impact right so there's you and your partner and then there's everything else that surrounds you which Mm. in-laws work kids all of these things that have an impact and you're just like but we're okay and then the whole world is just coming at us to get you and that (laughs) has an impact yeah so a lot of these myths that we kind of go through in therapy is that Mm. I had this idea I had this expectation of what this would look like and now it doesn't and now everything is falling apart. It's bad. It is bad. It's bad. And we've come here. And a lot of the times I sit with the couples and I'm like, yeah, this is normal. Yeah, this is what's supposed to happen. Yeah, no, you're not crazy. No, you're no, you're fine. (laughs) (laughs) And so I think that there's a lot of peace and like, oh, that's us, right? But there's such a perfect example. So there is this statistic from the relationship gurus, Dr. Julie and John Gottman, who've done research with couples for decades. And one of the things that they found in their research was that 69% of the problems that couples have are what are called perpetual problems, which are reoccurring problems that may not have a solution and that you will be arguing about for your forever, for your whole relationship. And if you stop arguing about it, that means that it's bad. It's probably bad, it's actually. You probably don't care right. enough to have this argument anymore and you're just kind of given up, mm. right? And so a lot of couples come in with these arguments that they just can't get through. We just mm. can't see eye to eye on this. And so I say, yeah, that makes sense. You probably won't. And you'll have to find a way to deal with it or you have to find a way to manage it or cope with it or laugh about it. I know it sounds terrible to laugh about this problem, but that might be the only way that you get through this because there's fundamental differences with the way you view the world. Yeah. So you're not abnormal. You are part of that 69% (laughs) or no, you're part of all couples that will have these arguments or differences that, that will no never solution. be resolved. <laughs> You're fine. You're normal. That kind of brings me uh, comfort. Okay. So it can go either way. For some couples, it is awful. Like, oh my God, we're never going to figure this out. And for some, it is this comfort of, oh, then it's not just me. And I'm, yeah. and I'm not alone. <laughs> <laughs> not alone. So it can go either way. It can be yeah. very disappointing for some couples to find out that they will be arguing about this one thing for the rest of their relationship. And for some of these arguments, they are fundamental differences. Mm -hmm. For some, they're these gridlock kind of issues. And for some, they might actually be what are known as non-negotiables and things that they will not agree on. And the relationship may have to end because it means that they would be giving up on something or they would be negotiating something that they're actually not willing to negotiate on. Which hopefully you want to know those non-negotiables. Oh, hopefully. Earlier. Hopefully, but I can't tell you how many people (laughs) get married and don't talk about it. And then they're in it and then they realize, oh, okay, so that's not going to change or that's not going to look different. And you don't, you don't want to have kids? <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. I mean, I grew up, I love my mother so much. And she <laughs> has so many amazing talents. But the talent to find a partner is not great. Okay. She has, she has, she was always like the, I'll fix it person, you know, mm. I'll fix him. I'll mm. fix him. Mm-hmm. I'll be able to, you know, oh my and gosh, no. growing up and seeing that, I'm just yeah. like, oh my God, that's. Yeah. That's a big project to take on that is 
99% always fails. Oh, it's a, it will more likely than not be a failure. I agree with that. And one of the questions that I love to ask couples is if this thing that you cannot stand about this person never changes, would you still want to be in a relationship with this person? Because more likely than not, it won't. And that is a big question for people to kind of think about that I hope that they look at before they get into marriage or before they look at before moving in together because unless that person has a big epiphany aha moment about themselves and they're ready to change and do they work it won't and you cannot fix them and you will be miserable trying to fix them so if you could you're sitting in front of a couple right now that's considering getting married if you could ask them whatever X amount of questions in order for them to understand if this is the right move for them, what would those questions be? Yeah. So definitely want to go towards core values and way of viewing the world. How do you view the world, right? Is the world essentially this happy and cheery place where things are going well for you and things happen for a purpose or is the world against you and is everything, you know, gloom and dark? And that really impacts the way that you do this day to day. That really impacts the kind of life that you might have with this person. And again, afterwards deciding, are you okay with this person's way of viewing the world? Right? Is their positivity exhausting and you can't stand the fact that everything is great and happy and you've just woken up and it's a great day, right? Right. Or the opposite may be true. So we're looking at how do you view the world through which lens? Mm -hmm. Also, the finance one is also a question. The idea of how do you envision your life together? Do you see this as a life with kids? Do you see this as a life Mm -hmm. without kids? Do you see this as a life? Whatever that image, do these images look similar? Similar. Mm -hmm. And if they don't look similar, is that image okay with you? Are you okay with that? Do you, could you potentially want that as well? Maybe you haven't even thought about it, but you're okay with that. Okay. So it's a lot of these big questions about life and how we view it and what do we want out of it and what do we value and what's important and do we hold tight to these core things that make us who we are Mm -hmm. and kind of checking in with those, I think, that's like the first layer of questionings. And then we dig a little bit deeper into specifics. But that's like a good, mm-hmm. that's a good base. Yes. Amazing. Go there first. And then you sign the contract. <laughs> Which is open. expires in five years. Yes. And open to <laughs> renegotiation. <laughs> I love it. Maria, thank you so, so much. Where can people find you? Yeah. So I am on Instagram at Holistically Grace. Website is Holistically Grace. And if you're looking for a therapist in Miami, <laughs> yes, you can find me there as well. Amazing. Thank you. Thank you, Valerio. Thank you so much for watching this episode. I hope you enjoyed it. Don't miss my newest episode right here. And if you're listening to the podcast on Apple or Spotify, please go and leave a review with your biggest takeaway. I love reading your thoughts. And if you have any suggestions for guests or topics, you can leave them in the comment section. And always, always remember, you are not alone.